much for joining us. This is going to be great. We've got about an hour together to chat about how what, what makes for really great storytelling. And so just really quick uh, by way of intros, uh, just we'll, we'll, we'll keep it super quick. Uh, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Jeff Gotthelf. I am um, an author and a, a coach and a consultant, trainer, public speaker. Uh, most recently, I've written a, a few books, one called Lean UX, uh, Sense and Respond. But uh, most recent book is called uh, Forever Employable. It's actually up here in the, in the corner because the virtual background won't let me show it to you very easily. Um, and it's about how to think about your job and your career as a product or a service and how to kind of build a reputation and a um, a, a professional, a personal brand around yourself based on your expertise and your experience so that you create a situation where you attract opportunities towards you continuously. Uh, that's what the book is about. Now, one key component of doing that well that I talk about in the book is storytelling. And so when I got Bill's uh, regular newsletter recently uh, where he was talking about storytelling. Ah, I, gotta, I gotta bring Bill in and have us talk about it. Now, um, Bill's gonna do the majority of the talking, but I'm gonna do the intro. I'm gonna introduce you to Bill. Um, I met Bill, I think Bill it was, I think it was 2013. I think that's right, yeah. That's Bill, right? Um, 2013, I was looking for, I was writing a new talk for a pretty significant conference uh, appearance that I just got and I was a little nervous. Uh, and even though I'd done a bunch of conferences up that, until that point, I decided to take the opportunity. Bill came recommended from some other colleagues as a, as a speaking coach, a public speaking coach. And I said, okay, great. And Bill and I worked together on this talk that uh, went surprisingly well. I mean, I mean, not surprising, amazingly well, uh, courtesy of that. And, um, and the interesting thing is that, is that the, the, the sort of passive keeping in touch that we've done over the years has been largely due to the kind of content and storytelling that Bill has done, and I suppose that I have done as well. And, and just kind of being on Bill's mailing list, when that story came, when he when his post on storytelling came out, I was like, I gotta talk to Bill, I gotta bring him in and, and have this chat. So if you don't know Bill, uh, he's a speaking coach who works with individuals, he works with groups about how to be the most effective uh, when presenting virtually, which is what we're all doing these days, uh, or in person. He's got a background as a performer. Um, in fact, we were, we were talking the last couple of days about how he's got all these old mixtapes that he made back in the 80s, cassettes, and somebody, somebody has shown interest in them recently, and so he's been ripping cassettes to digital for distribution. Um, Bill launched his practice in 2011. He's been working with tech companies and startups and coaching uh, founders how to pitch for funding and helping introverted engineers transform into engaging speakers, enabling new managers to motivate their teams. And he's worked with pretty much everybody you can think of, Amex, uh, AMC Networks, Capital One, Harvard, Hearst, MailChimp, MetLife, Spotify, et cetera. So Bill, thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely, thanks so much for having me. You know, one of the things when we worked together was we delved into stories and the stories um, about your history in the circus. <laughs> yes, right. Right, which was just like, how how much more compelling could you possibly get? Like everybody, most people, many people want to run away and join the circus and you actually did that. Did. <laughs> so that was a key part of this, your story and really talking about that. So everybody has a story. Everybody has something that's unique and specific to them. And um, delving into that, mining that, finding that is, is a really big part of a great way to introduce yourself to others and a great way for you to stand out and be unique because it's really it's your own unique story and we all have those. And look, and I think what's interesting is, is then figuring out how to take those stories, tell them compellingly and tie them into the point that you're trying to make. Because a lot of folks will be like, okay, Jeff, you, you were in the circus. I bet you got some great stories, but how does that relate to uh, you know, forever employable or, or lean right. UX or sense and respond, you know, sometimes you have to stretch it a little bit, right? <laughs> right. But, but we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, folks, I've, I'm gonna, I've got a bunch of questions for Bill that, that we've come up with that we think will, will help kind of share some of his expertise with you. Um, a couple of things here. Um, if you've got any questions for Bill, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom interface, there's a Q&A. Uh, area, just please put the questions there. It's just easier to manage the questions there than in the chat. If I do see if I do see them in the chat, I'll definitely try to incorporate them. 
but if you can put them in the Q&A box, uh, that'll be great. And then um, at the very end, we've got uh, some URLs to, and some uh, offers to share with you that you can work with Bill um, specifically around some of that stuff as well. So um, let's jump into it, Bill. And, and look, so we're talking about storytelling and what makes for a compelling story. Um, we use that word a lot, story. Um, what does it mean? What's, what it, like, what's a story? What are the components of a compelling story? Um, like when, when you hear that word, what does it mean? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, over the years in thinking about that, because everybody talks about story and storytelling and I, I even, you know, I've taken some storytelling workshops and sometimes it's like, it's so convoluted. I'm like, okay, there's rising action, there's falling action. And I'm like, oh my God, what does this really mean? And how can I use it? And, and, you know, in, in your book, you, you outline, you know, some real basic tenets of storytelling, right? So you've got the characters, you've got a plot, you've got a story arc. And I think that all of those are true and important elements of the story. But what I often do to just get a, to back up from it is I think it, often has to do with us trying to deal with some sort of a problem and how do we deal with that, right? So something happens and then you respond to it and how you respond to that, um, usually you often learn a lesson from that. So an example I sometimes use is, it's as simple as like in the morning when your alarm clock goes off, eh, 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 right? You hit the snooze button, goes off again, you hit the snooze button off again, right? And so what's happening right there, that's a story, right? Immediately because your goal uh, is to get more sleep. You really want more sleep, right? Yes. Um, and, but that alarm is keeping interrupting you. So right, that's really keeping you from achieving that goal, right? And so eventually, hopefully you get up out of bed. Um, and then what happened as a result of that battle? Did you win or lose, right? So if you missed that important meeting or you missed your train or whatever, then the lesson is that, you know, you need to get a louder alarm clock or you need to have someone come and wake you up. Um, but what, what actually happened? What did you learn as, as a result of that? So I, I often just think in, ter in terms of in life, it's kind of a series of obstacles, right? It's like everything is an obstacle and, and it's how you deal with that uh, and, and talking about that. And of course, now that's if you're telling your own story, but you know, if you're talking this, telling the story of a, it's a user journey, like what's their challenge? They're trying to get to this thing and there's something in the way. So how do they respond to that? And how can we respond to get them to be a successful place or get to you know, what it is that they're seeking? So, so does there need to be an obstacle in every story? In, in other words, like there's, is there always some, is the, the, some kind of conflict, would you call it a conflict, I guess? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think so. Like, you know, there's some sort of conflict inherent. I mean, you look back to the history of storytelling, there's, that's really, it's, there's always been that, right? And it's just how, how do you kind of get over? Otherwise, it's just, there's nothing to the story, right? It's just kind of like a flat line experience got it yeah. okay so so you, you've got you've got a sense of what a story is right it's, it's some it's the, the way that you overcame a challenge of some kind whether it's just how I, how I got my ass out of bed this morning forgive me right for that or which which can be a challenge at times or it could be something far far more significant right hey how I dealt with 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 a COVID layoff and, and found my next career or whatever it is or the hustle that I did with that um, and so then you've got these experiences, these opportunities, these, these, these things that you've gone through where you've overcome an obstacle, you've achieved some kind of success, or maybe you didn't, right? And yes. there's still something to be learned from that. And right? that's where you talk about, you know, what are the things, you know, in your book, and I also encourage people to talk about what we call wart stories, those stories of like, oh, something really didn't go well, or something went terribly, and, and what you learn from that, right? And also to just add, so all stories really have three elements, beginning, middle, end. So it's yeah. really thinking, if you can, when you're telling a story, if you can just back them and just think, what's the three things I'm gonna include, beginning, middle, and end is really an important. The beginning is that sort of setup of the character, whether it's you or whomever it is. The middle is what happened, what are you doing battle? What's the conflict? And the end is, how is it resolved, right? Yeah. What actually happened and what did you learn from that? It's interesting. Like I, this happens to me with my kids all the time. Like, uh, and my kids are, are teenagers now. They're a lot older, a lot older. So it's happening less because I, I get a little 
frustrated with this sometimes, but they're like, they'll come, they'll come running into the room and they'll be like, I need a towel, right? Which is the end of the story, right? And I'm like, can you just back up to the beginning? We're like, what happened, right? Well, I was filling the fish tank and then the cat jumped up and tried to get the thing at, like, you know, eat the fish. And then what I was doing, like, and then now there's water all over the floor. Okay, that's why I need a towel. Like, like I need, you know, and maybe I need the towel part is the most important part of, at the at the moment. But that's, but but it, it, look, it sounds simple when you say every story needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, but but so many stories start with the end. I need a towel. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. actually, why? Why? Give, give me give me a sense of like what what's happening between, you know. The beginning and, and now so that I, I can at least d decide whether or not I'm going to give you a towel. Or not. And you can play around with that too and of course uh, you know stories and movies do that like Breaking Bad starts right at this peak intense point and then we go back and find out what's happened so that's like that hook that really gets people into it so there are ways you can play around with that um, to think about what's that or you know the order yes the end ultimately will find that out but you can also sometimes in telling it, start with the action. Um, but I guess when I'm talking about storytelling, the basics of it, I don't want to get people too confused because it confuses <laughs> me a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, you can kind of move around and start with that one in intense action point and then give us the background of how it got there. But there's a lot of ways you can do it. Got it. Okay. So, so we've, we've got the, we've got the, the conflict, the obstacle, the thing that we're trying to overcome that we have overcome. Maybe we, we struggled with it a little bit. Um, how do you tell a good story? What are some good techniques, like very practical techniques that folks can take away for telling a good story and, and telling a good story means telling a, a compelling story, right? So, so people are engaged, they're following along. Um, and, and hopefully there, if, if there's any kind of an, a request at the end of that, at the very least they're hearing that. So what, what are some good yeah. techniques for telling a good story? Well, I'm gonna answer that by telling you a story. Um, I'm 18, I'm standing on stage for the first time. My mind goes blank. I can't remember my lyrics. My body heats up, sweat pools at the tip of my nose, drops the stage. I can't remember lyrics. I don't know what I'm doing. I start to sing numbers and letters. N four three, N four three. Afterwards, in my car, in the parking lot, I burst into tears. I'm sobbing. I will never, ever, ever get in front of an audience again. And the windows are steaming up. Then there's a car keys on the window. I roll it down. Where you been? We've been looking all over for you. You ready for the second set? <laughs> I'm not going to go back out there. No way. Well, look, the band is ready. The audience is ready. It's up to you. So I just get out of the car and I just take one foot in front of the other and walk back. This time I have my lyric sheet in my hand and we kill it. The audience loves it. So what did I learn from that? Well, for me in that moment, if I had just stayed in that car and not chosen to just give it one more try, my life would have totally taken a different trajectory. I would have never been in multiple bands. I would have never studied acting. I would have never entered into this profession, into this work that I do, which is really a lot about helping people to move through that to the other side. So that story is really about many things, but one is, you know, don't give in to your fears and don't let that kind of fear holds you back from moving forward. Mm -hmm. So, so there are some, so as, if you think about the story and tech, so what are some of the techniques yeah. that I use? So what, if you think, what, what were some of the things that you noticed? So at the very least, right, I could, I could kind of visualize some of the physical uh, things that were taking place in the story. You did, you did a really nice job of, of detailing you know, the sweat at the tip of your nose, the windows steaming up, the, the keys on the window, right? Those are things that we've all probably experienced at one point or another, 
Um, and it was very, very, like, it really helped set the, the tone for what you were going through at that particular moment. So that was, that was really interesting for me. I pick, I picked that up and that was, um, that helped keep me engaged in the moment and kind of help help me feel what probably what you were starting to feel at that moment. That was certainly one thing that I'd heard. Yeah. So, so sensory details, and I use a lot of them now, you maybe just pick one when you're telling a story, right? Um, I use a lot of them sort of because I want you to have some examples to, to think about and to, to, to notice because those sensory details are something universal. We all feel those, right? Everybody has felt that sense of nervousness for a variety of reasons, right? And what physically happens, our body goes into fight or flight and our heart rate goes up and we start to sweat, right? So everybody can relate to that and immediately, boom, we're connected. So those sensory details, even if you just use a one or two can be really powerful. Then the other one I use a uh, technique is thinking in terms of bullet phrases. I'm 18, I'm standing on stage for the first time. Mm. Right, and so it's interesting because it puts me in the here and now and the audience in the here and now, right? And this is one you have to practice a little bit, but um, can be really very powerful for people. Um, and then the other one is taking plenty of pauses and almost thinking like it's really these bullet phrases. I did this, then this happens then this happens. So one of the hardest things whenever you're speaking is like, oh, dead air. You think, oh shit, dead air, that's not good. And it's, it's, it's hard, you have to practice that. But particularly with stories, I want, you want the audience to follow along and fill it in on, on their own. So you, I'll, oftentimes we tr try and give too much information to stories, right? We'll say, so what happened was I was in this club and it was in Nashville, Tennessee. And it was kind of, we go, whereas we just say, I'm standing on stage, right? Mm -hmm. we, we know immediately where you are and all of those details, right? So bullet phrases gives that audience a chance to really take it in and have their own experience with it. Um, I think, yeah. look, I think it's, 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 it's interesting that you're talking about the pauses too, because just as someone who's been on stage in front of a couple thousand people and certainly in front of a couple of 20 people or two, I've been in front of two people as well uh, in various places, those pauses, doesn't matter how big the audience is, those pauses feel like an hour, Yeah. right? that would yeah. be a second and a half that feels like it's an hour up there, but they, they add so they, they add that second that the audience needs to process what you just said yeah. uh, and goes a long way. The other thing I noticed you doing a lot of, and, and you're telling a story about something that happened in the past, but you're speaking in the present tense. Yeah. Why are you doing that? Well, part again, partly because it helps a couple things. One, it helps me re-experience the moment as I'm telling it, right? Mm -hmm. But it also, um, it, it gives the sense that it's actually happening right now, as opposed to me reflecting on it, commenting on it, letting you know how, it, how I feel about it. It's like, I'm just like, it's like watching a movie and it's actually right there in front of you. It's actually happening in the moment. So speaking in present tense is um, a great technique to really bring everybody into that specific moment in time. Um, and you're not judging it, reflecting on it, commenting on it. Fascinating. There's one other thing too that I think, um, it, it, and you hinted at it um, a little bit earlier, but I want to bring it up explicitly here, particularly when we're talking about techniques for storytelling, um, is humility. So you didn't you, you, you didn't tell, you didn't start to start with, I'm on stage, I'm killing it. There's a million people there cheering my name everything's going Bill's way, right? <laughs> right? It's, it's, you're like, hey, I'm on stage and I'm freaking out and yeah. things are going horribly wrong and, and I'm, I'm ready to give up, right? I'm gonna, yeah. I'm bursting into tears. Like, these are things that I think, um, I think a lot of folks, um, and, and I think it's, a, it depends on the culture that you grew up in, but I think yeah. a lot of folks feel like, well, I gotta share only the good stuff. Right. right. Only the wins, only the the things that that I did that were successful. Why is being humble and sharing everything effective? Well, you know, a big piece of this is if you're speaking, you already have a platform. 
you already are kind of a, not really obviously above, but you sort of you're on a platform, you're on a stage, you know. So if you what if you can talk about things that were challenging for you, then that makes you human. And that makes us connect with you. That makes us see you as one of us. And that is a key part. So I do a lot of leadership training and that's a key part for leaders to be able to show some vulnerability because when you show that vulnerability, then you create that connection and that bond with your audience. Um, and they, they root for you, they relate to you. And they also are thankful that you're willing to talk about challenges that you've had right? It just humanizes you and, yes. and really is, a, is a, a great connector. And, you know, a lot of leaders are afraid to share, you know, some things that sometimes may be pretty personal things. And I, of course, you need to make a decision about what you want to share and what you don't want to share. Um, but it's interesting when I've seen examples of when people go pretty deep, it can have a really profound effect on their audience. Um, and it also tell, they'll really remember, um, you know, the power of that story and, and just being willing to be vulnerable in front of a group um, like that as a leader or really anybody is, is really a powerful experience. And you're right, there's nothing I hate worse than someone's like, yeah, I was out on stage, I was killing it. It's like, oh God, or you have a platform and you're talking about how great you right. are. That's just not, <laughs> that's not, it's just not appealing to us, right? Yeah. So, you know. Humanizing, I think that's, that's the word I was gonna use as well. I think, I think that's exactly it, right? Because you're on stage or you're in front of people or you're in, you've already got that position of, of authority to some extent, right? You're, you're, you're literally elevated in a lot of, in, in, right? And certainly metaphorically elevated. And so for you to kind of bring it back down and say, look, I'm, I'm not any different than you. I, I've, you know, I've had some success, but I've certainly flopped just as much as, as anybody else. And here's that, which is great. Uh, re, re, I think a really, really important tip for all of this. There's a bunch of really good questions coming in. I'm gonna hold those until, um, until we, we fit the end or the timeline, the timeline that we've identified, like the last 20, 15, 20 minutes. Um, but if you've got more questions, please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, the next question I have for you, Bill, is this, um, when and where should people use storytelling? Is this something that we do all the time? Is this a technique? Like, is this just one of those things that we have in our toolbox that we pull out when we're trying to convince someone to do something for us? right, um, you know, to, to hire me or to pay attention to me for some reason or to, to believe in my, in my plan. Like when, when, when is this the right technique to use, storytelling as a whole? Yeah, I, I think um, you mentioned this in your book and this is really the first things that I talk about and get clear with anyone I'm working with whenever they're gonna be speaking is, who are you talking to? Mm. Like, who is your audience? Yeah. Um, and, and what do they care about? Um, and how can you speak to their concerns? And so telling a story that they can relate to, they are the protagonist, is a, is a, is a, great, is a great opportunity to, to tell a story. Um, I think anytime you want to connect with someone, um, I think definitely this is, you know, when I work with a lot of people who are interviewing, and the biggest challenge and what we work on most is, because people can work on interview, how they answer interview questions, but the one that I work with people on is, so tell me about yourself. And so that's an opportunity for you to tell your story. And um, what brought you to this point? And so there's a, an exercise that I, I do where we really look at, okay, from birth to now, <laughs> what's your story and it's usually pretty long and then we kind of narrow that down and then we pick out what's relevant to this particular job but oftentimes people will gloss over the most some very important things that they go like yeah that's not really re relevant to this job but I'm like okay if you study journalism that actually may be really important to this job because you're somebody who knows about headlines you're somebody who knows um, the importance of an interview, right? You, you, and the importance of structure and story. Um, so uh, it's, 
that's a great opportunity to tell a story. So I guess in answer, back up to answer to your question, when is a good time? I think it's any time you want to have some have uh, someone adopt your idea or someone to hire you or someone to um, follow your lead um, stories are, are really very powerful and again in the leadership training that I do that's a really big part of it storytelling is a huge part of it and and how do you tell those stories and what stories do you tell and um, one of the exercises is um, it's called the river of life and you kind of you got people have these big flip chart uh, paper, uh, give them a flip chart paper and magic markers and you like pick three major things in your life that were really positive and three things that were really hard and challenging. And these are major events in your life that caused you to look at life differently, uh, to cause you to take a stand, maybe cause you to shift perspective. Um, and we look at those, they make the list and then they have a conversation with someone else and maybe they'll use it, maybe they won't, but it's a, it's a great sort of mine. What is it that made you who you are? Mm -hmm. And what does that story tell about your values and your choices and your character and how you would respond and or be to work with, right? Yeah. If I, find you're interviewing. A, I do a lot of teaching and I find um, what I, I end up, it's interesting because as you were talking, this remind, reminded me of this. People will say, okay, Jeff, well, how you're asking us to work in this particular way, um, but we always run into this obstacle, right? How do we get past that obstacle? Whether it's a, a boss doesn't work that way or a, a different team or a department that's not cooperating or whatever it is. And I can't tell you, I, I probably, I guess that 90% of the time I start answering those questions with, let me tell you a story, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the story is when I was working with X and they were facing a similar challenge, this is what they did, right? Mm -hmm. And that illustrates the three things I was going to, I could have told you these three bullet points, yeah. but when you contextualize them in this, in this kind of story wrapper, they hit home a bit harder as well, which is, which is amazing. So look, you were starting to head towards a nice segue. I didn't want to go too far off track because um, we're segueing really nicely into the next question. And there's a lot of good stuff coming in the Q&A box. So I'm going to get to that in about 10 minutes, folks. Just give me about 10 minutes. Um, so if you've got any other uh, questions, put them in there as well. But you were heading in this direction. So I want to segue into this um, next thing, this next question. Um, personal experiences. So we mentioned I, I worked in the circus. Yes, that was 25 years ago. <laughs> God. It hurts just to say that number out loud. Um, how can my personal experiences enhance my storytelling and, and can they also hurt my storytelling? Mm -hmm. uh, I think you just have to think about context and think about, okay, you, you, you have a personal story. Okay, what's the point you're trying to get across? And very often, as I mentioned, storytelling, it's about, it's about facing challenge, a challenge and how you respond to that, yeah. right? Um, and so in those cases, it's really thinking in terms of how does this relate to the problem at hand? So for example, the story I told, boy, man, when the hell am I gonna tell that story? Well, it could be, um, I could say to a team, so team, uh, you know, I know the last two days have been really intense because the system is down and we're, you're afraid that any move you make is gonna bring it down again. And, and so let me tell you at a time when I almost gave into my fears, I'm standing on stage, right? And I tell, so what I learned from that is I actually have more knowledge after that than I had before. And we as a team have more knowledge now so we can move forward with confidence that whatever happens, we learn from that, right? So that's a, that's a way to contextualize and take that personal story and, and, and shift it into a business context. Um, as far as it's an interesting in working with people who tell personal stories because they're like, oh my God, I would never tell that story. And then they tell the story and the audience is like, they're just so moved by it. They will never forget it. And they, they think, oh, I shouldn't go into that. You know, it's a personal choice. Like how far do you want to, what, you know, how deep do you want to go? Um, I would say, you know, I think that the one thing is, is if it's very intense, either give yourself some time before you tell it from when it happened, <laughs> you know, and practice doing it so that you 
can make it through it and still get in touch with it, but not completely lose your shit. I'll give you an example. I have a friend of mine um, from high school died and this was maybe five years ago. And so I was wanted to say something at the memorial service. And I was like, I kept practicing. I would burst into tears. I was a wreck. I could, and it was just like, subsequent times I was driving on the way there. I was just like, I, I could not hold it together. Um, but I said it enough times so that when I got up, at first, it was funny because they said, does anyone want to say anything? I was like, I do, because I wanted to get it over with so I could like <laughs> say it and then relax. But, you know, by the, that time, I could talk about the things that I remembered sharing with him and growing up with him. And um, I was able to get through it, but it was partly through just technically saying it and going through it and having time to get emotional, but not lose it. Um, so, but when are they not good? I guess you would just have to think through, you know, is there a reason that this could be a problem? I, 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 I often, I just go to work, you know, worst case scenarios. I often think, well, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Right. And <laughs> playing that out. And oftentimes it's just fear of looking foolish, which, yeah. you know, yeah. Look, I think I think the other thing too is is you've got to connect. You've got to connect the story, right? So if you've got a cool story to share, um, that's great. It has to make sense, right? And maybe sometimes, like I said before, maybe you stretch it a little bit to, to make the connection. But um, I remember the, the talk that uh, we worked on all those years ago. I still tell the story because it's a circus story, and you know <laughs> I'm going to tell it forever, probably. But the story that we worked into the talk during that. Uh, and it's again. I'm t I still tell that story today. Um, is about the human cannonball. And you're like, well, how are you going to connect human cannonball to digital product development and and design and lean and agile and all these things? And um, and the interesting part about that story, right? The story is about not the current human cannonball, but how he like what happened to the previous guy and how this this guy kind of got the got the job. And the story is about assumptions. It's about assumptions that that the team made every day that they thought were true forever. And when those assumptions were no longer true, the, the act fell apart, literally, and, and someone got hurt. And then, you know, this guy took his place, right? So, so as long as you can kind of connect it, yeah. right, and segue into it, and you're not taking up a significant part of your story with it, I think, I think it makes a ton of sense. So that's yeah, a really yeah. helpful technique, right, to doing it. Um, yeah. What are some anti-patterns that most people make when telling a story? What what makes a story fall flat? Like in other words, people like people people go for it, it just doesn't work out. Like what? I I, I hold that for one thought because um, I was thinking. So when you were telling that story, it's also um, when you um, are. Oh, I totally lost my train of thought. That train derailed. <laughs> Shit. Oh, well, it'll come back to me. But um, okay. you were speaking specifically and I was like, oh, I had this thought about, uh, oh, I know it was. So what I often do when I'm working with clients, it's like, okay, what's the bumper sticker version of the meaning of this? Mm -hmm. So my story is don't, could be, don't give in to your fears. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Use the tools you need to succeed. There's, so it's it's really, so whatever story you have, how can you then take that, what is the learning from that? And what's the bumper sticker sort of saying that can communicate that universal thing that we're all going through, just like you described uh, yeah. about making assumptions. All right, sorry, that was it, I had to say it. All right, so yes, so when can, <laughs> when can, what is it that makes a story not successful? Yeah. And, and or, or fall anti patterns, flat. yeah. What, 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 like the, what are the mistakes that people make when telling stories that end up not working well for them? You know, I think that um, there's a couple of things. One is trying to, I think you have to think of brevity, right? So this is just like, if it goes on too long, um, so that can be a problem. I think too long of a setup at the beginning. So when mm -hmm. I'm coaching people, in groups, that's one of the biggest challenges is they feel like there's this long setup. We need to explain everything. If you just jump into the action, we will figure it out. And a lot of times, also in the trainings that I do, it's a, what we do is we rehearse it. We go through a process of rehearsing this um, in pairs and uh, pretty quickly so that you just, you have to get it to, to say it. You have to speak it. 
um, mm -hmm. out loud and get a sense of timing, etc. So I think going on too long, not actually practicing it first to sort of see how it tells. The, so the story I told, for example, first time was like 10 minutes, second time was five minutes, third time was third, you know, it just, or actually even more than that, it took a long time to really zero it down to those headline bullet phrases um, to, to make it, you know, work. Um, what other things make stories? Uh, there's no conflict, right? Yeah. And, you know, that's also a lot of people. So whenever you're telling a story, you've got to really think, what is the point of conflict? What is that? What is that friction point? What is it that the, so there's the, the um, treasure you're trying to get to, or the protagonist is trying to get to that treasure. What's keeping them from that treasure? What happened in the instance? And then how did it resolve? And why are you telling us? And what can we learn? Yes. So if you, if you, subtract any of those elements um it's just not that compelling a story so you got to really do have to think about that that conflict also sometimes people don't really talk about how it ended you know we're like but what happened <laughs> right <laughs> right uh, oh well uh, you know i've had, that's been a case where you know i've been storytelling uh, trainings where they build all this up and then they they bury the lead. They don't tell us exactly what actually happens as a result of that. So it's important that we kind of know the resolution. Did you win? Did you lose? That's really yeah. <laughs> keeping it. it and uh, yeah. I, need to, I need to connect you with my dad. My dad is infamous for doing all of these things, just telling me some of these stories that just go on forever. It's like, it's, his, it's what he's known for across the family. I think my father had a little bit of that too. My father was a yeah. civil engineer and he was so funny. My brother uh, had a project where he was going to record him for a typical day for a civil, civil engineer. And my father was like, well, the day starts with, I was just like, oh, I just, and my father is actually a really communicative person who's really people person, but boy, when he turned that recorder on, it was just like, yeah, flat. yeah. Um, I want to ask you one more question, and then we've yeah, got yeah. a ton of really good questions in the Q&A box, and I want, I want to try to get to as many of them as we can in the 20 minutes or so we have left, um, but I think this one's really important um, from, from the questions that that we prepped in advance um, for the world that we live in today, right? So a lot of the stuff that we're talking about has been the different, uh, has been about speaking or telling a story to somebody maybe in person, at a conference, in a meeting, one-on-one, um, -on -one, that type of thing. What are the differences that people should pay attention to um, between telling a compelling story in person versus telling a compelling story in a remote situation like we're doing right now and like most folks are doing these days? I tell you the one, this is the most, I've been work, as I've been working with people virtually before COVID, but you know, since it's all a big, big part of it is about your relationship to the camera. Mm. All my acting for the camera class techniques came back. So if I'm, if I'm telling a story, so what happened was <laughs> we started, people are like, is he looking at his email? Right. <laughs> or is there something more interesting that he's looking at? Because so you really need to practice and be aware of where is the camera, look as close into that camera lens as possible. Um, if it's maybe the top third of your screen, but that's super, super important because live, you know, I, I encourage people to make eye contact with people, give them a thought, let it land check to see if they've gotten it, move on to the next person, give them a thought, right? Mm -hmm. So, and in, and in my trainings, I'm running around the room, I have my hand over people's heads, I talk to this person for a second, then I run over here. So, you know, so that there is that connection, that back and forth. But uh, as far as camera, it's all about camera technique. Mm -hmm. And um, Raul Esparza is a Broadway actor, and there was a, um, there was a special that came out um, a few months ago. And he sings this one song, it was a Stephen Sondheim memorial, I think, or, or, or as his birthday, not memorial, but his birthday. And he, if you look at that, he is, his relationship to the camera is amazing. It's like, he's, it's like he's speaking directly to you. Some camera techniques that, you know, people have used in the past is put a picture of a very supportive person right next to the camera to remind you that, you know, you're talking A to people and someone that would be very supportive. Um, th those are some, that's one technique, but just 
practicing and being aware of that is really very important because mm -hmm. if you're not making eye contact with camera, people think you're not making eye contact with them. So it's a very technical, technical thing. Um, gestures, if you can use them, I use a little bit of gestures. I can be a little bit uh, gestury, but also placement of where you placed, you know? So if I'm, I'm going to slouch down, but if I'm like <laughs> this, like, there's a lot of space between my head and the top here and I look kind of small, <laughs> but if, if you kind of sit and try and just have a little bit of, you know, head uh, room above your head, that's going to be a little bit better. And we can see a little bit more of your body as you're, as you're telling that story. So those yeah. are some really important and just your, your background, what's in your background. I have this, I have, you know, this is my apartment. You can't see because I have this background. So it, it's important to, as best you can, to just have awareness of anything that might be distracting. I mean, we're, we're leaning in a little bit more into a lot of the techniques around virtual, but, the, but if there's someone walking behind me, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of distracting to the story. Yeah. And I try and you know, eliminate any kind of distraction in the background. Got it. Yeah. The other, by the way, the trick that, that I use, um, by the way, is I, I have googly eyes, two two googly eyes right here on on my, right below oh, the camera really? on the monitor, and so you got a pair of eyes looking at you. You've always got a that pair of eyes to look at. That is brilliant. So sticky googly eyes. Sticky googly eyes. Yeah. Right there, oh, right top of the. That mic. is really that's super smart. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. I like. I'm gonna steal that. Oh, two T's. Uh, <laughs> stealing that. All right. Listen, we've got. 16 minutes and a ton of great questions. So let, let's see if we can get through as many of these as we can. Uh, I'm gonna assume that smart is your real name and not just what, what you go by. Yeah, it is. That is my real name. Okay. Yes. Excellent, good. All right, <laughs> let's go with this one. Uh, so hero's journey. Is the hero's journey a good template for beginners for telling stories or is it something reserved for professional storytellers? I think everybody can be a storyteller, right? Um, yeah. And the hero's journey is, what is the hero's journey? It's like you start in one place, you end in another, and somehow hopefully the world is, that hero's journey proves to be better after whatever it is that they've gone through. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it has to limit to professional storytellers, right? Everybody yeah. can do that. You can really use that model. It's really the same model, I think, ultimately, um, I mean, there's elements of it that are a little bit, you know, more complicated, but it's really basically you're trying to get to this thing, yeah. deal with it, and hopefully you're better on the other end of it. Yeah, I, I, it sound, sounds like it's not necessarily an experts only tool. Which yeah, is yeah. All right. Next one that's up here. Is it okay to use animated body language during discussions in professional life and work environment using a business context to convey one, one's point, um, for example, during meetings? So I am, a, I, I, I feel it so often if I was like this, hi, so today I'm gonna talk, right? I'm not moving anything at all and I'm just kind of a talking head. So if I use my hands, gesture a little bit. I feel like that's more visual information for the person on the other end and they can then more effectively grasp what it is that I'm saying. Also, I, you know, if I tend to use facial expressions, which a lot, this is again, when I'm working with um, executives and leaders a lot, it's like sometimes they have like poker face. It's mm -hmm. like, hello, anybody in there, right? So we want to see the, like the, the person behind that. Now, that being said, it really depends on the type of conversation you're having. And is that, you know, is it appropriate? In other words, if you're having a conversation where you need to be empathetic, you need to be listening, then I think it's important to be aware not to, I don't know, be, I don't know. But I guess the one way we, we would do that is by nodding our heads yeah. and, and understanding. Now, some people have sit, you know, see that as, that can lower your status a little bit, right? But uh, I don't know. I feel like it's it's as long as it's not super crazy. I don't. I think it's probably okay. Right. So I guess to the answer to the question is, it it depends on the scenario. But I I I generally across the board don't think it's a bad thing to use gestures and body language 
as additional information to communicate to your audience. Got it. Okay. Excellent. All right. This is a good question. I like this one as well. Um, can you apply the storytelling techniques that we talked about today to written articles? Or, or are there other tips for written stories that would make more sense for writing versus uh, live delivery? Well, Jeff, I feel like you should take this because you've written so many books. But I, I, I will say, you know, from, you know, writing actually follows a similar structure, right? Where, but I'm gonna, I think you should take this, Jeff. Okay, well, I'm, I'm happy to say that, look, I mean, the, the things that, um, that have worked for me, certainly humility has worked really well in, in stories, written stories. Um, the, it's interesting because th there's, there's, a, um, there's a bit more of a balance between setup, like big setup and, and, and no setup at all. When you're speaking to someone, you definitely want to be more concise. But when writing, you really got to you got to paint the the full picture. I think, and so I, I might err on the side of a slightly bigger setup when yeah. I'm writing. Yeah. But there, but but otherwise, it's definitely you know, as a team, we set out you know, especially when I'm writing uh, very practical stuff about how how to work a particular way or how to solve a particular uh, challenge that a team is facing. I'll talk about when when we face this challenge with this client what they were trying to do was build this application in this context. And there was a radical change then in the leadership of the organization. And, uh, um, and that was the challenge. And then what we did to get over that. So, so the, the whole aspect of kind of overcoming a challenge is there, the specificity is there, the practical application is there, certainly the humility is in there. It's like, oh, we tried to make friends with the new boss and that was a disaster, you know, and this is, and it led, it set us back a month, right? Stuff like that. And then coming into it. But I do think that there's some, some, some probably some more setup you have to do uh, in, in, in written articles that you may be able, you may be able to avoid in a live setting, um, or you may be able to, especially if you're presenting, if there's a, if there's a, 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 a slide deck behind you, uh, the slide deck can carry a lot of the context setting when you're presenting, so maybe you don't have to say as much, right? So again, I think a lot of this stuff definitely does apply. Yeah, and I think, um, if again, I was back in the like, but it, it, to me, it goes back to problem solution. Why are you writing? Well, there's probably something that you're gonna share with us or there's some sort of problem or something that you are trying to solve. So in that way, I think it's, it's similar, but absolutely, as Jeff said, it's, it's a, it is a different ball game in a lot of ways when you're writing, depending on A, what you're writing, the length of if you're writing a book, if you're writing an email, um, you know, how you approach that. But um, I think they all lead with one, who, are, who am I talking to? The most important thing. Who am I talking to? What do they care about? How can I speak to and somehow give them something of value? That all goes back to that. So um, I think that that's when I'm working with people on talks. That's that's what we start start with. So uh, you know, Jeff, when you were you know working on your book, thinking in terms of this is this one thing, right? This is how I did. This is how I did this. This is how I kind of got to this place. Um, and this could be really helpful for a lot of people. This is a process, right? I think, and, and the one thing that we haven't explicitly said, which I think is really important is, is obviously know your audience, which is super critical. What do they care about? But you, you have to speak in their language as yes, well. Yes. Right? Thank you. Yes. Use words that they care about, right? I, I talk about this all the time with, with designers that, you know, for, for, gosh, 20 years at this point, um, when it comes to de designers that I work with, they say, well, how do I convince my boss to do X or to do Y? I said, well, your boss doesn't care about pixels. They don't care about fits law or time on task or click targets. What they care about is revenue, mm -hmm. uh, retention, sales numbers, right? Yeah. That type of thing. So how is the work that you're doing related to that translated into the language that they care about now you're telling a more compelling story to that audience, right? That's that's actually what they care about. Yeah, yeah. And that's a big piece of the, the work that I do too is often, and you've said this, Jeff, as well, that um, you may have a similar con similar content, but that's gonna change depending on the audience and their relationship to that, right? So that's a, a really key part of that that we often, often people miss. Yep. So. 
Um, Carol wants to ask, what happens when we don't have a platform? Does humility still have the same effect? Hmm. Gosh, I think humility always has a great effect. Yeah. You know, when you're just human with people and just connect with them and, and share challenges that you may be having, having, you know, I think that humility is, we need more of it, <laughs> the truth be told. Um, and, you know, uh, as far as seeking a platform, Jeff's got some really amazing ideas about that in his yeah, book. For, for it's sure. really specific. You know. Yeah, you know, I, I think, look, I think the humility aspect of it actually helps you build a platform. Yeah, I, I think that if you're if you're telling, you know, I, I talked to a group of um, 18, 19, 20, 20 year old folks recently about this idea of telling your story. And they said, hey, we're 18, 19, 20. What story do we have to tell? We haven't done anything yet. And I said, well, then tell. And, and these are folks who just graduated from one of these um product management boot camps, like a 12, one of these 12 week, 16 week courses. And I said, okay, well, tell, then tell the, tell the story that you have, which is, hey, I'm 20 years old. I just finished this, this technical boot camp, and I'm starting my job search for my first real job in this field. Tell that story because there are just on this call, there were 30 other people just like you who want to hear that story. And I can tell you that there, there are orders of magnitude, more people just like you in that position who would be interested in that story. So if, if you don't have a platform, if you don't, you don't feel like you've done enough or you're just starting out to, to be able to tell compelling stories, then narrate the thing that you're currently doing because that's, that's your experience and that's, what you're, that's what's actually happening. Um, by the way, folks, we are definitely not going to get through all of these questions as well uh, in the time that we have. That's my email address. Bill, do you want to pop your email address in the chat too so yes. folks can, can ping us directly with any questions that we didn't get answered? Um, so let me ask you the next question while you're doing that. Um, Alexander's asking, how to build your base of stories to tell? Do you use only stories that happen to you? Or should you, can you use stories that you also heard from other people? Sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> sure. Yeah, so, so should, do you, should you only tell your stories, things that you've done, you've experienced, or can you tell other people's stories as well that you've heard from them or that you've, you've, seen, you've seen other people do? Oh, sure. You can tell those stories, you know? Uh, and yeah, I don't, I, I don't it, I guess it would <laughs> depend on, if there's any reason they would need to know that or or if you know if you're telling a story naming them but uh no that, that happens all the time in storytelling i mean that's what you know yeah so i don't i don't have a i don't see a, a problem with that as long as there's a, a, a learning in that story and right? attribution right so so attribution as well especially if it's if it's not your story yeah you can say, I saw Bill Smart give a talk one time, right. and what he, what I heard him say, or the story that he told during that yeah. talk, was this type of thing, right? So just yeah. just make sure that there's attribution uh, for for the source, yeah, as well. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get it to through as many of these as I can in the next four minutes because I need a minute to close. Um, uh, I've always struggled with having a story library ready for a variety of situations in business to be effective. Do you have a core set of stories that are your go-to or do you ideate on the fly? Mm, I think it's a great idea to develop those stories and to really, to, so I'll akin this to my acting days. So oftentimes, basically, usually when you had on-camera interviews, they would say, so tell us something about yourself. Yeah. And you'd say, if you said, I'm an actor looking for work, not so compelling. So we had to really come up with what are the, the things that we can say that would be interesting and or compelling, right, stories to tell. So what I would, uh, you know, maybe think about this exercise of going back over your life from birth to present and, and three major huge events, things that happened to you in your life that caused you to look at life differently, that caused you to change direction, um, that maybe formed your values in some way, three really challenging things, and then three really affirming things that happened, right? And what, and what did you learn from each of those? So that could be a place to start, 
um, to really think about cataloging those because what you're doing is you're talking about the human experience, the, the challenge. And usually in business, there's some obstacle we're trying to get over. There's some, and, and it's how do we deal with that obstacle? Are we, you know, how do we approach dealing with that? And it's almost always a universal thing that relates to those personal personal things. So I love that yeah, idea, actually. Yeah. I love the idea of building a library of stories. It doesn't have to be 50 volumes deep, yeah. right? But if you have like three to yeah. five, I know that I have, I have three to five. Now they come from experience, from work that I've done. And they're stories I tell over and over and over again. They're generally speaking, they're case studies. But, um, but I think that's a really interesting idea there is, is if, if this is something that you're not doing regularly today, building that catalog of three to five stories and then leaning on that catalog whenever you need it um, can be really powerful because it feels like it's off the cuff, but you've, you've done the work um, to prep that. That's a really interesting pattern. And I'm telling you in these trainings, we give people 20 to 30 minutes and they've like, okay, your life, 20, 30 minutes, you have a limited time. You're just going to write. And it's amazing what it is that, you know, people come up with. Uh, so, yeah. Got it. Okay. I think we have time for one more. I'm going to choose carefully here. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, I like this one. This, this one's interesting. So we'll go with this one. Um, Emily asks, I'm very comfortable crafting uh, to meet the audience. But because of that, I get a bit overwhelmed if I don't have enough info about the audience to inform choices, style, etc. Any tips on how to deal with that, with, with crafting a story, I guess, when you don't have good audience intel? Like you don't, mm. you don't, you don't know exactly who you're going to speak to. Uh, it's very, it's an interesting, interesting question. Um, usually, usually if, if there's, if it's an audience and there's a wide variety of people that you're speaking to, I always think of, okay, who are the decision makers? Who are the influence? Who is a person that actually can forward my, my idea and I kind of aim the talk maybe towards that audience. But in other ways, you can just give context and you, you could say, um, uh, so say you're speaking in, about something that's super technical and you're not sure if everyone's gonna understand it. You could say, so I understand there are some technical people here, but I also understand there's people who just have general knowledge. So just as a level set, here's here's the general landscape of da 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 so you know so you can back up and give it the sort of layman's terms and then you could also go into the details as well so that's that's one way to be able to just cover your bases so that everybody understands you know also too i don't it depends if your talk will have question a q a part of it because you may find out more there. You, you could kind of go over the general message and then um, you can say, so I, I'm gonna leave some time for questions and then people will ask you specific questions and you could put stuff in the index um, or an appendix uh, and then go to that and speak yeah. to that. I like, I like that to kind of give a sense of, of, of what's there. Excellent, Bill, thank you so much. This was, thank you. Uh, this was fantastic. Great. Tons of fun, folks. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, we got through a lot of material. If you didn't get your question answered or you think of one later, feel free to ping Bill or I or both of us together. We'd be happy to get back to you. I did post um, Bill's uh, offer in the chat there as well. So you get a chance to get a sense of um, how uh, what it's like to work with him. Um, if you haven't picked up a copy of Forever Employable, I encourage you to do that at, at your favorite digital bookstore. Um, any one of them works. Um, and if you do pick up a copy, I would love a review on Amazon as well. Otherwise, folks, thanks so much for joining. Any feedback at all, feel free to ping me directly. And we hope to see you all soon uh, on the next one of these uh, Forever Employable webinars. So thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Right. Bye, Bill. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah.